Um, thanks everybody for coming. So as she mentioned, I'm I'm Jerry, and and I like everyone to meet my wife Heidi, uh, who's here joining us. And we have we we have a a, a 14 year old who uh, is uh, challenged with waking up in the morning. Uh, she had a late soccer game last night, so she's getting all of her rest. And I was telling Molly that her punishment will be when she gets home, she'll get to help me do the speech again. Um, so, um, but born and raised here in Wyandotte County, um, third generation uh, Wyandotte Countyan. Um, full disclosure, I, I live now in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I consider it part of the outreach program to spread Kansas um, throughout uh, the city of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, but grew up here, went to high school here. Um, Wyandotte County is home. Um, and I say, I share that home. Wyandotte County is home, and then Lawrence, Kansas is like home, home. Like, I feel like my heart is both here in Wyandotte and in Lawrence all at the same time. Um, equality. The thought that I was having about equality as we were Getting, as we were talking about this and preparing for this conversation. And the thought that came to my mind is that equality does not equal equity. That equality does not equal equity. And so what does that mean? And so um, when I think about equality, I think you know, an example I'll use is, is our daughter. She runs track um, uh, for her, her school. And she runs a couple different events, and one of the events she runs is um, the 100 meter dash. And so in the 100 meter dash, everyone lines up in the same exact space. They're all in a row. You have one through eight. They line up in the same space. They have the same starting block. They're going the same exact distance. It is completely fair and equal because they're all going the same space. She also runs the 200 meter hurdles. Now, equality would say, you're, you're all running 200 meters, let's just start everyone in the same space and you run 200 meters. But the problem with the 200 meter hurdles is that some people, if you were to start everyone at the same space, some people are gonna go less than 200 meters and some people are gonna have to run more than 200 meters. So it's not possible to line people up in the same exact space. And what you have to do is you have to space them out on the track. So the inside track, if you go a full circle around the inside track, it's actually a shorter distance going around the inside of the track than it is on the outside of the track. So it wouldn't be fair to start everyone at the same exact space and say, take a full lap because the people on the inside are gonna run less. And the people on the outside are gonna run more. And that, to me, is the difference between equality, the 100 meter dash, and the 200 meter hurdles, which is more equitable, because they stagger them out to make sure that everyone is doing the same thing, going the same amount. And so that, that thought that equality does not equal equity. And so in looking at Wyandotte County, you know, the social determinants just came out. Um, the county health rankings for 2016, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with these county health rankings, but um, it ranks every county in the state of Kansas, one through, and this year it's one through 101 <coughs> counties. There's 105 total counties, but 101 are reported. And it says, oh, Wyandotte County is last, and lo and behold, Johns County is first. Why is that? I mean, don't they each, we each have hospitals? We each have schools, we each have businesses here in Wyandotte County and Johnson County. We all have, we have the same thing. They have parks, we have parks. They have bike lanes, we have bike lanes. We have, we have all the same things, but we don't necessarily have the same amount of things. But beyond the same amount, we all, we're dealing with different realities. And so when articles come out and they say, oh, well, what's the matter with Wyandotte County? Why can't, 
why can't Wyandotte County move the needle? It's like, well, all things aren't equitable. They're equal. We have all the same things, but they're not necessarily equitable. And so the question is like, why, why is that? How is it that you have one county <clears throat> next door to another county? They have all the same things, and yet their outcomes are completely disparate. You have the healthiest county, quote unquote, healthiest county, and the least healthiest county, quote unquote. Why is that? Um, there are a couple thoughts with that. I guess first, to just dispel that health disparities on their own are not a natural phenomenon. They don't just happen. There's no such thing really as a naturally occurring disparity in health. Like um, people are not genetically disposed as individuals or as a community to just have worse health outcomes than another person or another group of people. They don't just happen. Um, I would say that the second part of that is not only do they not just naturally happen, it's they happen as a product of design. Many times, poor design. Not necessarily intentionally poor design, by the way. Um, which, which may or may not be as dangerous as unintentional or uninformed design. Haphazard, um, just making things up as you go, just kind of make, just doing things. Um, but an example, let me give you an example of a policy that is a design instrument that has actually had a, a negative impact on Wyandotte County's health trajectory. And it's a policy called redlining. Is, is anyone familiar here with redlining? So redlining is the process of <coughs> sectioning off neighborhoods and communities. And it's uh, purposeful in that it's designed to keep certain people in and certain people out. Um, actually, the folks at the KU School of Architecture Design and Planning, Matt Kleiman, is helping, had helped us with a project that we're working on right now to understand why Wyandotte County has the challenges that it has, looking uh, specifically at who's going to the emergency room, how often they're going, how they're getting there, who's being frequently readmitted into the hospital. So they go to the hospital, they get discharged, they show up again in 30 days. And so we're starting to try to, we're starting to figure out like who are these people and what's causing that. And the folks at the School of Architecture Design and Planning helped us out with finding old redlining maps. And they date back to the late 20s, early 30s. And it's amazing, you look at this entire map, it was an, of the entire metro, KCK, KCMO, and you just see the areas where people of color were sectioned off, but then you start looking at over the decades, from the 1920s all the way to the 1950s, to the 1980s, to now, you know, the, you know in the 2010s, and you still see that the, the, the levels of home ownership levels of poverty, all the same. You wouldn't know if you were looking at a map of 1925 or 2015 based on those original redlining maps. And then you go through and there's like hand, there's typed descriptions of each neighborhood. And there's a section, it's like percentages, percentages of married couples, percentages of whites, percentages of blacks. And on the, on the notes that were made on these hand-typed memos, where there were people of color, blacks, they were circled. And then they would leave notes in the bottom saying, oh, you know, Parkwood community, we're starting to see an increase in blacks moving to the area. And, and they were making notes about like how valuable a property is based on who lives here and who doesn't. That is intentionally bad design. It's design that was made specifically to favor one group over another group. So when we look at communities now, 
and go, well, why can't this community just, why can't they pull together? What's, what's wrong with the schools in this neighborhood? Why can't we, uh, why, what's wrong with the parks? What's wrong with the sidewalks? What's, what's wrong? Why is there so much violence here? Those things didn't just happen. There were policies that were set in place almost 100 years ago that created the environment that we have now. Um, we look at Johnson County. Well, why is Johnson County number one? Another policy, less intentional, but um, the GI Bill. So the GI Bill was created for individuals who were serving in the military, that they would serve in the military, and when they got out, they were given an opportunity to go to school, purchase a home. It's great. Um, a lot of folks in World War II, uh, the Korean War, really took advantage of the GI Bill. The only problem with the actual bill, though, is that it was really designed to favor um, whites. And there were social systems that were set in place that really prevented African Americans from taking advantage of the GI Bill. So if home ownership is the precursor for wealth, wealth attainment and building up wealth, we have generations of folks who are allowed to purchase homes relatively cheaply, go to college relatively cheaply, and we have other groups of folks who were denied access, um, either through intention or through cultural norm, they were denied access to that same opportunity. So we fast forward to 2015, and we look at what is average household wealth for African Americans, Latinos, compared to whites, completely disparate. And you look at home ownership, the percentages are almost the same. Who's owning homes? Who doesn't own homes? Who's attained wealth? Who's not attained wealth? That is policy that has designed a reality. So why is there such bad design? Or why is there design that has terrible outcomes? And a part of what we've been trying to do as a community health council is trying to figure out how do, we, how do we understand the people that we're serving in the community? And a big part of the reason why there's such bad design is a lack of understanding of who the people are in community. Who they are, how they experience life in community, identifying what it is that people actually want in community. Um, a good example um, for how we were trying to understand this is we were confronted with a crisis in Wyandotte County in 2013. The Affordable Care Act was about to introduce their health insurance marketplace. And um, everyone, everyone in Wyandotte County, including myself, just assumed that there was a large uh, group in Kansas City, Missouri called the Mid-America Regional Council who was going to handle this enrollment. They had applied for a grant, they get almost every grant that they go for, and we just knew they were going to handle it. And uh, I get a phone call, and they're like, hey, bad news, Mid-America Regional Council did not get their grant, we need to know what you're gonna do about enrollment. I'd been on the job for about a month, and had no idea what to do. And so I reached out to Wesley, and a uh, professor at the KU School of Medicine, and we're like, okay, we're gonna have to sit down and we're gonna have to figure this thing out. Um, and over the process of meeting and talking and really beginning to meet with folks in community and start to understand what is it that people, what do people currently understand about the healthcare law? What is it that they're afraid of? What's going to get them to buy health insurance? What will keep them away from buying health insurance? Um, we began to start putting together different ideas, and some were good and some were ridiculous. Um, but the idea was, the more we interface with community, the more we begin to understand how to put this thing together. Um, I think the two people most largely associated with figuring it out are Lucia and Molly um, from the Health Council. Um, and what we did was not necessarily science, it was art. It was just the art of building relationships with folks in community and really trying to understand. So 
a good designer of any process seeks to really understand. And on the flip side of understanding people, I think on the other side is actually caring. So there's one thing to actually understand what people want. The other side of that is caring about what people want. And so in the world of design thinking, we would just call that empathy. We understand and we care, okay? Um, I'm getting the, the five minute um, speech. But, and I don't want to undersell that because from their work of building relationships in Wyandotte County, we started to see a change in, in how things began to operate. Um, we understood that having access to health insurance doesn't really do anything to improve health equity. Um, over the last two and a half years, we've seen the level of health and the, the level of uninsured go down. We had about 26% of the people uninsured in Wyandotte County. Now it's under 20. I think it may be closer, getting closer to 15% of the community is, is uninsured. So we've seen improvement in that area. But we recognize that having access to health insurance doesn't really do anything. Um, what we recognize is that there are so many different systems in place that make it difficult for people to get healthy and stay healthy. And so we had to assess what is it that we can do to begin to move the needle. And for us, we recognize that we have to be able to have a structure of collaboration that didn't currently exist in one night. Our thought is that if we can make collaboration amongst the folks improving health, if we can make it easy, if we can make that partnership effective, if we can actually begin to see change, and if we make it so effective to the point that people actually want to work together, we can make that process enjoyable. We felt that if we could provide that, then that would be the baseline by which we could begin to move the needle in Wyandotte County. Um, and from that, we're starting to see some things coming out. Um, you all have started, the team has started a, a program called Take Charge, where it's post-enrollment. It's like, okay, so now you have health insurance, what do you do? Um, we're now wrestling with the question of, you're leaving, you're leaving incarceration, <clears throat> what do you do? Um, or, I've got health insurance, I have a doctor, I, I don't know. I don't know how to get. I don't know how to get to my doctor's office. I don't know how I'm going to get to the pharmacist. I don't know. I don't know what to do. And so from that, from Take Charge, there's a community health worker initiative. So we're deploying a team of folks whose job it is is to assist people in thinking about how to develop their strategy, how to address those issues that are keeping us unhealthy. Um, and then beyond that, beyond that is thinking about now that we've figured out how we want to start doing this work together, how do we do the work together better with folks in the community? Um, we're working on a project right now that's being funded through the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And we're partnering with Healthy Communities Why Not. Um, and a few of the folks in this room are a part of this initiative. It's a Healthy Parks Initiative. And the whole idea around it is how do we actually improve the quality of parks in Wyandotte County? But I'd say the work is actually bigger than the parks. Because the real work underneath the improvement of the parks is the empowerment of people. So as part of the project, each park has neighborhood residents who are taking leadership on the park. And we have money set aside for the improvements, but it's the people from those neighborhoods that are making the decisions on where that money goes and how it's spent. And the idea behind it is that powerlessness at the core of all of these social determinants of health, that powerlessness is really the underlying issue around the social determinants of health. And so at a very small level, we're like, Let's begin to transfer power. Let's be starting with the money. So instead of the Community Health Council, 
instead of me deciding how to spend this money, what if we let the neighborhoods decide how to spend the money? Why don't we let the neighborhoods decide who is going to represent them as their community mobilizer? So the KU School of Architecture has community mobilizers, and it's the folks in community working with them to say, these are the people that we want to represent us and to mobilize us. And it's a, it's really a, a movement. It's a, a transference of perceived power to the people that actually have, have the power and should have the power. And our goal over time is that each community is empowered to create what they want. They have the expertise of organizing each other. They have the support of professionals like architects, like community organizers, like uh, city planners who can really begin to help them change the look and feel of their community. But we feel like the equity that we're looking for um, is going to ultimately move us to a place where we are radically-ish <laughs> people, but it's small, it's small steps. It's incremental. We have decades and decades of poor design that have led us to where we are now, and now it's the hard work of thinking about each other, <coughs> preparing for each other, working with one another to begin to move the needle forward. Um, I think I may be at my hard stop. Um, so the, just one last point, I guess I just wanted to emphasize that it's not a natural phenomenon that health disparities exist. It is a product of poor design and it's reversible. It's reversible. That's, those are the three things. So just know that it's not your fault. There's nothing that you did wrong. It is really, really poor. I mean, it's ridiculously poor design. We could spend time talking about, about how bad poor design has influenced us. And that's not reversible. We can change it. And we're starting to make that change. And we want to invite you all in, in joining us in helping make that change. So thank you. like Jerry who are sharing information, facts, knowledge, and also get to engage uh, artistically. Today we will be hearing in a moment from our second spoken word performer and her name is Misconception. She won the 2014 Pitch Magazine's Best Poet Award and she is not just a spoken word performer, but also dabbles and excels in other performance arts, such as hula hooping and fire dancing. We won't be having any of that here today. But uh, before I invite her up, I want to invite all of you to take a look in the seat where you sat is a form where you can jot down some of your thoughts. What are your reactions to what Jerry had to say? What questions do you have that you want more information on? Or what barriers do you think there are to pursuing a better design of our communities and better health equity? After we hear from Misconception, then we will break into small groups for a, a few minutes of small group discussion, then we'll come back to the larger group for a Q&A with Jerry. So without further ado, let's take questions. Good morning. Good morning. I apologize. Not much of a morning person. A little groggy. But I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, poetry is the art of paying attention, which is terribly difficult in our Snapchat society. Um, and I also tend to use poetry, I think as poets, um, it gives us permission to like ask the questions that nobody wants to ask or say the things that nobody wants to say. So if anything in this particular piece is offensive, I apologize, it's kind of the point, you know, so that you go home and, and have conversations and ask the hard questions. Um, two other things I wanted to say, I used to work for an organization called Communities Creating Opportunities. It was a faith-based community organizing Group, and they began their community organizing by going in and asking the hard questions.
to the community using empathy. They wanted to care. Um, what keeps you up at night? Like that was just a simple question where we began to try and change the lives of the people in our community. Um, I work in a synagogue, and in this poem, uh, I reference Elohim, which is just a term for God or divine, whatever that means to you. Um, currently, I come representing an organization called Poetry for Personal Power, and we are. Uh, please do write write down that that term and check out their website, poetryforpersonalpower.com. Um, they're basically going into youth organizations, prisons, um, any organization, any nonprofit that will have us, and we are attempting to use art and poetry and music to address mental health and mental wellness. So specifically working with the teens and youth in high schools, um, giving them an opportunity to talk about depression, suicide, drugs, abuse, all of those things but in a safe space. The great thing about poetry is it um, there's nowhere else in the world that you can show up and and talk about some of these really hard things and then the community say, we embrace you, we love you, thank you for being great. So this is a poem called Rhythm and Poetry. And um, I wrote it because a lot of times people ask me, what exactly is it that you do? And I tell them it's called R-A-P, Rhythm and Poetry, spoken word knowingly, spitting our written rhyme alive, trying to stop time and wake you up at the same line. Shake you up from the divine, give it space to realign our men and women, unwind our minds, bend and redefine this crime scene and hold up. Let me start over from the beginning. See, I believe my generation has been kidnapped, a victim of the man, prey of this messed up plan in this crazy time and space, the entire humankind still locked in this rat race, not to mention the government's faceless force here to cover up the source of our true course of nature to date. Might be fate, ah, but there is an escape. Right this way, you see, come play with me. Create a new body, become one with your chi. Some say and pray ancient prophecy, while others claim and trade new age philosophy. But these wavelengths are all set straight from Elohim, so I'm asking you, please, let's rewrite history with this rhythm and poetry. Spoken word knowingly, spitting our written rhyme alive. Trying to stop time and wake you up at the same line. Shake you up from the divine, give it space to realign our men and women, on one our minds spin and redefine this crime scene. And y'all, I think we're on the brink of starting over from the beginning. So we all remember when we called for desegregation for black people, right? Okay. Now it is time to demand this kind of respect for fat people. For mad people and sad people, good and bad people. Poor people, war people, your people, more people, doormen and stormen, even whore women. Peace for the Native American Mexicans, firemen, gay men, the straight and the trip and the pimp and the limp and those just skimming along. It is time to rewrite this new freedom song that is not limited to one specific wrong because this shit's been going on too damn long inside this rhythm and poetry. Spoken word knowingly, spitting our written rhyme alive. Trying to stop time and wake you up at the same line. Shake you up from the divine, give it space to realign our men and women, unwind our minds, spin and redefine this crime scene. And y'all, I think we're on the brink of starting over from the beginning. So I've decided, we've decided, with your help, of course, to start a new world order. Okay, okay. One not so much divided by all these foreign war borders. More focused on fair trade and local supporters. No more organic importers. That's for hoarders. Because this time, you're the gardener and the chef. You know what's best. Not this government dressed up for their cause. We no longer follow those laws. They don't make sense because they were never made for Jadets. Served up for the blessed in a world of the oppressed. We are no longer citizens of a depressed country built on protest. Y'all, it's time to rewrite a new address. A new world, fresh off the menu, coalesce, serve it all up for free. And I need you coming with me with this rhythm and poetry. Spoken word knowingly, spitting our written rhyme alive. Trying to stop time and wake you up at the same line. Shake you up from the divine, give it space to realign our men and women, unwind our minds, spin and redefine all these crimes, sit-ins, and I think we just started over from the beginning. That's what I'm saying.